Hello everyone and welcome to our module on structural eye disorders. As you probably know the eye is very complex but I've listed on the screen the major structures of the eye that you should know as a medical student. Now in other videos I talk about the pupil and the iris and the lens and also the retina and the macula but in this video I'm going to focus on these structures in the middle so that you understand what they are and you understand how they can become diseased. Let's start by talking about the sclera and the cornea, and I like to talk about these two structures together because they are continuous with one another. If you look at this picture of an eye on the left side of the screen, you'll see the white part of the eye, and that is the sclera. It's a connective tissue structure that holds the eye together. Now it appears that the sclera ends at the edge of the iris, however in actuality the sclera becomes the cornea, they are continuous with one another. The cornea is a transparent structure that covers the iris and the pupil, so the white part of the eye goes right up to the edge of the iris and then the cornea covers the iris and the pupil, and this is easier to appreciate in the cross-sectional drawing on the right side of the screen. This white part that I'm drawing a line through with my pen is the sclera, it wraps around the entire eyeball. However, at the front of the eye, the sclera stops and the cornea begins when you cover the iris and the pupil. Therefore, these two structures are continuous with one another and they wrap around the entire eyeball. Here's another picture just to make this even more clear. We've got the white sclera wrapping around the eyeball and then it ends at the edge of the iris and then the cornea begins. The cornea covers the iris and the pupil and then on the other side we've got sclera again going around the back of the eye. The sclera is composed of collagen. It's a rigid structure that stabilizes the eyeball. One of the most important things for you to know about the sclera as a medical student is that this is the site where the extraocular muscles insert into the eye, and this will be important in a minute when we talk about scleritis. The sclera is avascular and it gets its nutrition from a thin layer above it called the episclera and also from the vascular layer below it called the choroid, and we'll talk about both of these layers later in this video. Scleritis is what occurs when there is inflammation of the sclera. Patients who have scleritis develop dark red eyes. It's one of many causes of the red eye. Patients who have scleritis also have severe boring pain, especially with eye movement. And I've bolded the words with eye movement. The reason that scleritis makes it so painful to move your eyes is because the extraocular muscles insert into the sclera. And this is a very serious cause of the red eye. It can potentially be a blinding disorder. 50% of cases of scleritis are associated with a systemic disease, and among all the associated conditions, rheumatoid arthritis is the most common association. And this is easy to remember because you know rheumatoid arthritis affects connective tissue and the sclera is like the connective tissue of the eye. Episcleritis is another cause of a red eye. This is acute inflammation that involves only the episcleral layer. This is the layer that sits on top of the sclera. It's usually idiopathic and it usually presents with tearing, localized redness, and mild or no pain. It's much milder than scleritis and it's usually self-limited. And just like scleritis, episcleritis is also associated with rheumatoid arthritis. The sclera is separated from the environment by a transparent layer called the conjunctiva, which we'll talk about in a minute. However, the cornea has no conjunctival layer covering it. It is exposed to the environment, and therefore it can potentially become inflamed or infected, and this is called keratitis. Keratitis is corneal inflammation, and it's often caused by bacteria or viruses or fungi. Remember, the cornea is exposed to the environment, so naturally sometimes these agents can get in and cause an infection. And patients who are particularly at risk are contact lens wearers because the contact lens sits on top of the cornea, and it can potentially introduce bacteria or other infectious agents. People who develop keratitis present with pain and photophobia. They will have a red eye and they often complain of a foreign body sensation in the eye. And keratitis is very dangerous because remember the cornea is what allows light to enter your eye and hit the retina. So if the cornea becomes damaged, you can potentially lose your vision. So keratitis is a sight-threatening disorder. A corneal abrasion is a problem that is also common among contact lens wearers. It's often painful because the superficial cornea has lots of nerve endings. You can visualize a corneal abrasion by using a dye called fluorescein and using a blue light. It'll look something like what I've shown in this picture here. And one thing that's very high yield for you to know for your step one exam is that corneal abrasions can become infected with pseudomonas. And for this reason, this problem is often treated with ciprofloxacin eye drops. Ciprofloxacin is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic and it generally has good activity against pseudomonas. 
In the infectious disease videos, I talk about the virus HSV1. This is the cause of herpes labialis. And you should be aware that HSV1 can cause keratoconjunctivitis. This is inflammation of the cornea and the conjunctiva, those outer layers of the eye. It will present with pain and redness and discharge. And most of the time when patients develop eye disease related to HSV1, it's a recurrent infection, meaning that it's reactivation after the virus has established latency in the patient's body. Now let's talk about the conjunctiva, which I mentioned before. If you look at this eye on the screen, you can see the white part, which is the sclera. But what you cannot see is a transparent layer that sits on top of the sclera. That's called the conjunctiva. It actually wraps around the back of the eye and reflects and goes to cover the underside of the upper eyelid. So the conjunctiva is exposed to the environment, just like the cornea is exposed to the environment. So as we will see, it is vulnerable to a number of infections. So conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva. It can be viral or bacterial or allergic. There are many, many causes of conjunctivitis. Patients who develop conjunctivitis develop injection of their eye. This means you can see blood vessels in the conjunctiva over the white sclera, like in this picture on the screen here. They often have some form of discharge. And conjunctivitis is very common. It is the most common reason for patients to present to a physician's office complaining of a red eye. Viruses are the most common cause of conjunctivitis, and of all the viruses, adenovirus is the most common etiology. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We'll also talk about measles, which is a special viral cause of conjunctivitis that you should know for your boards. And as we've already discussed, HSV1 often reactivates and causes keratoconjunctivitis. In addition, there are a number of bacterial causes. I've listed some of the important ones on the screen. We'll go through these in the next few slides. So let's talk some more about adenovirus. It's responsible for up to 90% of cases of viral conjunctivitis. It will lead to development of a watery discharge. And I've bolded the word watery because that's very important in board questions. It helps you distinguish this from the purulent discharge that is seen in bacterial conjunctivitis. Adenovirus is a non-enveloped DNA virus. It also causes pharyngitis and pneumonia. Adenovirus is famous for being very stable and able to survive on surfaces, especially kitchen and bathroom counters. It's often transmitted by either aerosol droplets, fecal orally, or contact with contaminated surfaces. And because this virus is so stable, that's why children who develop pink eye, which is another term for conjunctivitis, are often sent home from school because if they stay at school, they will often spread the virus around the school and more children will become infected. The measles virus is the cause of measles, which is also known as rubiola. I talk about this in detail in the infectious disease section. It's a paramyxovirus. It's an enveloped RNA virus. It's rare in the modern era. It's been largely eradicated by vaccination. But what I want to point out to you here is the classic triad of symptoms for the measles virus is cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. Children who develop measles often have injection of their conjunctiva from the virus. In addition, they often have a maculopapular rash, like this child shown on the screen, and they also have coplic spots, which are characteristic spots you can see in the mouth of children with the measles virus. Bacterial conjunctivitis presents with copious purulent discharge, and I've bolded the word purulent because you need to recognize that in a board question to help distinguish it from the watery discharge of viral conjunctivitis. In adults, Staph aureus is the most common cause, followed by strep pneumo and H. flu. In children, H. flu is the most common cause, followed by strep pneumo and Moraxella catarralis. There is a special form of bacterial conjunctivitis that can occur in newborn babies. This is called neonatal conjunctivitis or ophthalmia neonatorum. These infections in newborn babies are due to Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia. The baby gets infected from passage through the birth canal. And if left untreated, this can lead to permanent visual impairment for the newborn baby. So for this reason, all newborn babies have erythromycin ointment applied to their eyes at the time of birth. That way, if by any chance they were infected with one of these two bacteria at birth, they are now treated with the erythromycin ointment in their eyes. Another condition that can lead to conjunctivitis is reactive arthritis. This is an autoimmune disorder triggered by infection. It's classically triggered by some type of GI infection. So it can be triggered by Salmonella or Shigella or Campylobacter or Yersinia or sometimes C. diff. It can also be triggered by Chlamydia. So the classic presentation is a patient who has one of these infections and then days or weeks later develops arthritis. That is a reactive arthritis. It's not that the bacteria have spread to the joint. It's an autoimmune problem. And the classic triad of symptoms that reactive arthritis presents with used to be called Reiter's syndrome. This involved arthritis and also conjunctivitis and also urethritis. So many times following one of these infections, a few days or weeks later, patients would develop arthritis, but also a red eye and also pain with urination. And this was the classic classic triad of Reiter syndrome. 
Another potential cause of conjunctivitis is a simple allergy. This is allergic conjunctivitis. Many people are sensitive to certain allergens, and when exposed, they will develop red, watery, itchy eyes. So allergic conjunctivitis typically presents with bilateral, itchy, watery eyes. And I've bolded the word bilateral because in a board question, when you read that the conjunctivitis is bilateral, you should suspect an allergy rather than an infectious agent. Viral or bacterial conjunctivitis often affects only one eye. Allergic conjunctivitis is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. There is histamine release involved, and it's treated often with antihistamines. The final structural layer of the eye that we'll discuss in this video is the uvea, and the uvea can be confusing as a student because it contains a number of different eye structures. So if you look at this drawing of the front of the eye here, you can see the iris, which I'm drawing a line through with my pen, and also the ciliary body. These are important structures in the front of the eye, and they are part of the uveal layer of the eye. However, once we get out of the front of the eye, there is this layer called the choroid. It sits below the white sclera that I'm marking with my pen, and the choroid is also part of the uvea. So there are three structures that are considered part of the uvea. They are the iris, the ciliary body, and also the choroid. This is easier to appreciate if I zoom out and show you the entire picture of the eye. So the white layer that I'm drawing a line through with my pen is the sclera. Beneath it is the vascular layer of the eye, and that's called the choroid, and it wraps all the way around to the front of the eye. However, in the front of the eye, the choroid becomes the ciliary body, which blends into the iris. Therefore, all three of these structures, the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid, are part of the uvea. So when we say a patient has uveitis, we mean they have inflammation of the uveal coat. It may involve the iris, the ciliary body, or the choroid. Basically, this means there are white cells found in the uveal layer of the eye. What's confusing about uveitis is that there is a lot of different terminology that is used depending upon which portion of the uvea is involved. So for example, if there is anterior uveitis and the iris is inflamed, it's sometimes called iritis. If both the iris and the ciliary body are inflamed, it's sometimes called iridocyclitis. In the back of the eye, if there's posterior uveitis, this is sometimes called chorioretinal inflammation, and that's because the choroid and the retina can be involved. And then there's also something called intermediate uveitis that involves vitreous humor inflammation. All these varied terms are used because the uveitis can involve different portions of the uvea. The symptoms also vary depending upon which portion of the uvea is inflamed. So if the anterior uvea is inflamed, this leads to symptoms like pain and redness. This is similar in some ways to scleritis and conjunctivitis and those other causes of the red eye that we discussed before. If there's posterior uveitis, this often presents with vision problems. So it can be painless, but there can be floaters and decreased vision. There are many, many causes of uveitis, but some things that are worth knowing is that it can be infectious, and it's often caused by agents that otherwise infect the central nervous system. So for example, you are probably aware that HSV and CMV and toxoplasmosis and syphilis are infectious agents that can infect the central nervous system. They can all also cause uveitis. In addition, you should know that uveitis is often associated with systemic inflammatory diseases. And if you just remember that the uvea is the vascular layer, then it's easy to imagine that systemic inflammatory conditions can send antibodies and white cells into this part of the eye to cause inflammation. And here's a list of some of the systemic inflammatory conditions that are associated with uveitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a classic condition that is associated with uveitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a spondyloarthropathy. It involves inflammation of the spine, and it's associated with uveitis. Reactive arthritis, which we discussed earlier, is also associated with uveitis. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis is another uncommon condition. It's associated with uveitis. And then also rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoid, psoriatic arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease all are associated with uveitis. The final topic I'll mention in this module is a hypopion. That's an inflammatory infiltrate in the anterior chamber of the eye. This is an example of one shown on the screen here. This is commonly seen in end ophthalmitis. That's inflammation that involves the aqueous or vitreous humor of the eye. This often complicates surgical procedures involving the eye. If bacteria get into the eye, that can lead to formation of a hypopion. This can also be seen in keratitis and uveitis and a number of other conditions. It's usually bacterial, but there are examples of sterile hypopians as well. And that concludes our module on structural eye disorders.